What's in them? Peanut butter and jam! Are you trying to kill me? On paper, it sounds like a criminal offence, doesn't it? Putting peanut butter and jam in the same sandwich. That's peanut butter and jelly to all our American viewers currently writing very confusedly in the comments. But then you put it in your mouth and everything just makes perfect sense. Just like when you get those video games that, on the surface, look like they totally shouldn't work, until you play them and they do. Why is Donald Duck, Woody from Toy Story and that spiky haired weirdo riding around the street in giant flashing teacups? Here are seven games that have absolutely no right to be anywhere near as good as they are. We'll start with Kingdom Hearts, the series that inspired this list, because good lord, Kingdom Hearts 3 in particular, which I'm playing through right now, is absolutely off its rocker, the video game equivalent of a messy child's bedroom, toys from various different movies and shows thrown about all over the place, their individual artistic origins discarded as they are bound together by a singular narrative born from the free-flowing imagination of the child that owns them. You know, when I was a kid I had I had Thunderbird toys, and I had Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtle action figures, and Bucky O'Hare, and Action Man dolls, and you know, they didn't go together at all, but when I played with them, they did. And that's the magic of Kingdom Hearts, it's the ultimate expression of free play, a joyous medley of characters and worlds from all across the Disneyverse coming together and overlooking their differences and making friends and vanquishing evil. It shouldn't work, should it? You've got Sora, who looks like her traditional JRPG protagonist. Slightly cartoony, spiky hair, really big feet. And then you've got classic Disney characters like Mickey Mouse, Donald Duck and Goofy. And then flipping Captain Jack Sparrow shows up from Pirates of the Caribbean, looking all photorealistic and they're all hurling flashy Disneyland attractions at Heartless, while a group of evil looking people in black leather coats stand about being deliberately enigmatic in cutscenes. Makes perfect sense to me. Maybe I'm reading too much into it, but for me, Kingdom Hearts has always been a story about branching out, leaping out of your comfort zone, meeting people who at first seem completely different and terrifying, but that through the course of your adventure, you learn are just people like you, fighting against the darkness, doing whatever it takes to help their friends, and never being too old to have loads of fun on Disneyland rides. Our second entry is Thomas Was Alone, a 2D side-scrolling puzzler where you control some shapes. Thomas, the titular character, is a rectangle. He doesn't speak, he can jump a bit, and by the end of the game, you will love him. This is largely down to Danny Wallace, who provides a VO narration that describes the personalities of the various shapes you control. All of a sudden, what was before just a game about getting various two-dimensional shapes from point A to point B by having them work together to solve platforming puzzles, becomes so much more than that. It's like a shape soap opera. Each character has their own desires and insecurities and character flaws, often cleverly linked to their physical characteristics. For example, James, and look at him, you can just tell, can't you, that he's got the weight of the world on his sides. James has a disregard for the laws of physics, and so gravity works backwards for him, meaning he walks on the ceiling, if you can say walks, and leaps towards the floor. The other shapes used to bully James because of this, which made him feel isolated, which I suppose would happen if you turned up to parties on the ceiling. If you haven't played Thomas Was Alone, don't think of it as just a 2D game about jumping shapes, even though that's what it is. Instead, think of it as a life-affirming journey through the human psyche, with Danny Wallace being all Danny Wallace in your ears the whole time. Lovely. Katamari is next, a series of games that you just have to play, because if you listen to someone try and explain to you why you should play it, your face will look like this. Dave has just been told about a game where you control a small green man with a head like a Christmas cracker, whose dad is a fabulous god of all creation, who's tasked with rolling stuff 
up into a ball until it grows and grows and grows and you go from rolling small things like dice and chairs and terrified people to buildings and trees and eventually actual planets. I know Dave, you're confused. Why would you want to do this? Well, I could tell you Katamari is a series all about interconnectivity and how even the smallest, most inconsequential thing has its place on the cosmic stage. But if I did that, I'd be clutching at straws and trying to sound clever because really it's just a fun game about rolling stuff up. Stop listening to me and play it. It's really good. Entry 4 is Akami, one of my favourite games of the entire PS2 generation. It's on PS4 now as well, so if you missed it back then, and you probably did, about 7 people bought it in 2006, you really need to play it now, and here is why. It's a game where you play as a sun goddess in the body of a wolf, and your godly power is a magic paintbrush with which you can watercolour things into existence, or in the case of combat, watercolour them in half. You can pause the game at any time and just paint stuff all over the top of it using the analogue sticks. The world is literally your canvas. You can paint leaves onto trees. You can paint spouts of water or bombs or fire. If it's a bit dingy, you can even paint the sun into the sky because you are the sun goddess. After all, you can't be stopped. The entire world looks like one big swirly watercolour as well. And this shouldn't work. You know, the whole idea of constantly pausing the action to paint your way through combat and story just sounds like a frustrating, fragmented experience. Plus, you can't paint with a video game controller. I mean, come on. Turns out you can. And it's amazing. You'll feel like an artiste and a superheroic one at that. One that can bring life and colour back to the world with a simple flourish of paint. Many games cast you as a god, as some kind of supernatural being, but few convey what that really means, like Okami. You have tangible power over the world around you. You know, Amaterasu has abilities that astonish not just you, the player, but the inhabitants of the world in which you're playing. They are dumbfounded by the magic of it. It really does feel as though you're painting new physical laws into existence, especially when you're slicing down trees or conjuring fire to destroy your enemies. Enemies that, no matter how tough they seem, are all bound by their own coded mortality, shackled by the rules from which you feel liberatingly exempt. Okami is a video game that understands precisely what makes playing a video game feel so good. You know, it empowers the player. It gives your actions weight and consequence within the gameplay. And simply put, it's just a wonderful, joyous experience from start to finish. Play it. Next up it's Catherine, which, if you strip it back to the bare bones, is a puzzle game where you have to ascend giant block structures and reach the top before either they collapse or you get killed by one of the many hazards along the way. That sounds pretty benign, right? How about if I tell you these puzzles are a nightmarish manifestation of protagonist Vincent's guilt and or his inability to face up to commitment and responsibility? And that after finishing each stage, you have to face some demonic creature hell-bent on murdering you so thoroughly you die not just in your dream, but in real life too. Real life within the game, that is. You know, you're safe in the actual real world. I think. Catherine is developed by Atlas, the studio behind the Persona series, and was their attempt at exploring something a little more adult, although if you've played any of the Persona games you'll know they can get pretty dark. Your character, Vincent, has reservations about marrying longtime girlfriend Catherine with a K. He's scared of commitment and doesn't want to leave behind his carefree bachelor lifestyle and so ends up initiating an affair with Catherine with a C, an event which essentially kickstarts his block puzzle filled nightmares. There are daytime bits as well where you basically just sit in a bar and manage your relationships, a bit like Persona and also a bit like Persona. There's no real way I can describe Catherine to you 
that does it any kind of justice. Catherine, as a package, sort of brings together those disparate parts, the puzzles, the story, the daytime bit in the bar, in a satisfying, cohesive way I'm unable to explain through words. So stop listening to my words and go and play Catherine. It's getting a PS4 release on February the 14th, so there's a great opportunity for you to not ignore it this time. Undertale is our sixth entry, a game I've spoken about a few times on the channel as I constantly wrestle with my own opinion of it. Currently, I like it has, I'm not quite so sure, pinned down and seemingly out for the count. It's taken me a while to adjust to Undertale and appreciate what makes it brilliant, but brilliant it undeniably is, despite on paper sounding like something you'd look at as a mere curiosity. Undertale is a JRPG style game made by one person, Toby Fox. Visually, it's a throwback to the 8-bit era. The battle system is kind of a bullet hell, dodge all the enemy projectiles type affair, but the twist is you can play it without fighting anything. Instead, you can charm or compliment your way to victory, saying nice things about your adversary in the hope they'll suddenly like you enough to leave you alone. A bit like my real-life fighting style back in school. Yeah, watch out, I'm a black belt in compliment judo. So yeah, yeah, Undertale, a 2D retro JRPG style adventure that subverts genre tropes and that punishes you with a practically impossible boss fight if you ignore the warnings and kill everything in the game instead of talking your way out. It's really funny, really clever, really imaginative, and really loads better than you might think. And if, like me, you initially weren't sure about Undertale, then go back and have another go. Go on! Your hair looks really nice today. Our final entry is Persona 5, which I've included as a way of representing the entire Persona series. When you're describing these games to someone who's never played them before, they sound... <sighs> How shall I put this? They sound rubbish, okay? They sound like something you would never want to play. So you play as a school kid and your time is divided into days. You can do one activity per morning, afternoon, evening, etc. And that will usually involve hanging out with your school friends and managing your relationships with them which in turn yields bonuses to your personas, which are basically a physical manifestation of your inner psyche that imbue you with power during battle. Yes, you have to battle too, and sort of fit that into your schedule alongside going to school, hanging out with your mates and making coffee. And if you don't get the thing you have to do done before the allotted time runs out, it's game over basically. Start again and be better next time. Yeah, I've already got like an actual life persona. What's so great about this one you're offering? Well, look, the menu, for one, look at it. It's cooler than a polar bear's bathroom, and I'd literally just play that for 20 hours and slap a big fat 10 out of 10 on the box. Best menu ever, would browse again. But also, the characters, the story, you'll become so invested that it's hard to think about anything else. I remember when I played Persona 4 Golden on PS Vita, I'd get off the train and immediately start missing Chie and Yosuke and Yukiko. You know, it felt like they were my actual friends. And I'd count down the hours until I could get back on the train home and hang out with them again, going to the cinema or the shopping mall or the weird monster-filled world inside the television. Yeah, it's weird as well. Bottom line, I often get messages from people saying they've never played a JRPG before. Should they take the plunge with Persona 5? And the answer is an emphatic hell yes because it's a game that transcends the boundaries of genre. Its quality is undeniable, and if you give it the time, it will give you an experience that's way, way better than these lousy paragraphs I've just written about it. And so there we go. Seven games that have no right to be anywhere near as good as they are, but they are just brilliant. Let us know in the comments if you can think of any others. Give us a like if you enjoyed the video, and hit the notification bell to make Make sure you stay up to date with all our videos. Thanks for watching and see you next week for another Friday feature. For the players.